Testing, testing. Good evening, everyone. Good to have you. It is Wednesday, November 18th. You are there. We are here. Uh, good to have you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Still, I thought we might be out this week, but it's probably going to be not. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I actually have a title. Sometimes I title these. Um, I often title them and never tell you the title, but the title today is The Delusion from God Based on the Decision of Man. But we're only going to get to part one of that. So we've been talking about end time events. We've been talking about the timing of the rapture. Uh, rapture is the next event on God's calendar. And the eschatological calendar is how the end times. And the only thing that has to happen before the rapture is what? Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. The only thing that has to, not before the day of Christ, the only thing that has to happen before the rapture is the trumpet. Hmm. Listen for the trumpet. That's all we're doing. We're listening for the trumpet. Uh, and then there's not everyone uh, agrees that the rapture comes before the tribulation. Uh, some hold to mid-trib, and of course that's just like it sounds. Tribulation is a seven-year period. Some hold that at three and a half-year point the rapture will come. And then there are those that are post-trib where the church, God's people, go through the entire tribulation and the rapture occurs at the end. So we're at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And um, just a quick review. So here's, here's verses 1 through 7 in a nutshell. In, in regard to or concerning the return of Jesus and our gathering together unto him, the rapture, uh, Paul says, don't be anxious, don't be troubled about the false news that you missed it and that you're in the tribulation. The day of Christ is at hand. Don't be deceived. Uh, it has not come, it can't come until there is an unmistakable falling away first and then the man of sin is revealed. Uh, verse 4, the man of sin will set himself up as God, but he cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the way. And we talked last week that the restrainer, I, I believe the Bible points to the restrainer being the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes the most sense uh, when you consider the neuter masculine um, article that's used in the Greek and a number of other things. Uh, verse 7 kind of bears that out as well. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. The, the spirit of the Antichrist always has been. There's always been a spirit that is against God. Uh, so the spirit works, but uh, this, the Antichrist himself is being restrained until God reveals him. Uh, could he be alive right now? Possibly. Um, something to always keep in mind, though, the Antichrist has to come, when we were studying Daniel, the Antichrist has to come from the ten, one of the ten kingdoms uh, that made up the Roman Empire at one time. So he's not coming from the United States, okay? He has to come. And so there are some, you know, you'll hear all kinds of things. You'll hear weird stuff. Um, like the lie. The lie is, I, I'm jumping way ahead because we probably won't hardly even get to that. But while I'm thinking of it, I thought it was rather humorous. Some consider the lie... One commentator, the lie is transubstantiation. Now, anybody know what that is? It is, a, it is a fancy word for when you take the Lord's Supper, when, the, when it hits your tongue, it turns into literally the body of Christ. Okay, well, that's gross for one thing. But there's some that teach that. There's churches that teach that, uh, that you literally partake and that's what one guy says is the lie. Well, as we've been looking at the context, and as we go further on in the context, that is grasping for straws because there's no basis in the text at all uh, to say that. So anyway, now we'll jump back to where we should be. Verse number 8. We 
We talked about six and seven last week. Verse number eight, and then shall that wicked be revealed. How many have wicked is capitalized? The W is capitalized in most every okay, so most versions do that where the W, so it's so it's not it's not wickedness in general. It is referring to a specific person, the wicked one. And of course, uh, the wicked one here, verse number eight, is who the wicked one's gonna be revealed. Who is the wicked one in verse eight? Would you say? Is it the man of sin? It's the man of sin. It's the same one as it's the one who's being, you know, the Holy Spirit is restraining the revelation of. Uh, he will uh, exalt himself above God. So the wicked is the same person uh, as verse number four, the one who opposes and exalts himself as God. So there, the demise, uh, verse eight talks about the demise or the destruction. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So the wicked will be revealed after the restrainer is removed. The wicked will be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at these verses one at a time. So the, the wicked, verse number eight, is the Antichrist. Uh, how, who, who is he destroyed by? He's destroyed by God. The Lord consumes him. Uh, how will he be destroyed? By his word. By, by God's word. Simple speaking. God speaks and it happens. Here's a harder question. When will the wicked be consumed? When will the wicked be consumed? Consumed. When he, when Christ comes on his white horse. On, wait, oh, wow, excellent. Yep, Christ comes on his on his white horse. Specifically, not the rapture when we meet him in the air. It's when Christ comes, his second coming, and we're going to look at that. And the only reason I bring that up is, you know, it's it, the the language is careful here. It, it the the restrainer will be taken out of the way, and then. The wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume. It doesn't say who, you know, it happens immediately. So we, we need to be careful not to push a timeline into something that doesn't give a timeline. It does say the wicked, the restrainer is removed, and then the wicked one's revealed, restrainer removed then, but it just says whom the Lord. It doesn't say, it, we don't have in this verse the point is we don't have in this verse when that is going to occur. Um, just to kind of refresh memory a little bit, I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, and, and we spent some time in Daniel looking at uh, those visions in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, and uh, um, I think we touched on Daniel 9 maybe a little bit. And then we looked at Revelation and compared the description of the Antichrist in the Old Testament with some things about um, the beast in Revelation 13. And yeah, it was primarily Revelation 13. So verse number one, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. Uh, we know later in the chapter that the crowns refer to kingdoms. Uh, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And then it gives a description, a little bit of the beast. Uh, verse number three, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. People were amazed of this miracle. I mean, uh, wounded, deadly wound, you know, is a wound. I mean, the, the implication is there. It's, it killed it. You know, there was a wound that killed it, but it was miraculously brought back to life, this beast. Um, verse number four, there was an understanding. They, they worshiped the dragon. 
Satan. We know Revelation dragon or dragon and Revelation uh, is is Satan. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. So the the and again we went through this once before. Just kind of refresh your memory, but uh, this is the Antichrist. Um, he he is uh, wounded at some point. All the world is amazed that he's resurrected, miraculously um, brought back to life. Uh, he is worshipped. Verse number five, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Uh, of course, three and a half years. So he, the, the Antichrist, uh, called here the beast, has power during the tribulation, uh, three and a half years years and then verse 6 he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God so it's it's basically I mean verse number 6 kind of echoes 2 Thessalonians 2 4 who opposes and exalts himself as God and sets himself up as God calls himself God uh, in the, talking about one and the same person has the same uh, mindset it is anti God uh, Revelation 19. So here's the beast. We're skipping a bunch of chapters, but the beast is the Antichrist. Beast is the Antichrist. Uh, chapter 19, verse number 11. And I'm going to kind of cruise through these, but you'll, you'll get the idea. Um, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. So white horse... A uh, person who sat on was faithful and true in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew, no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. So this is obviously Christ returning on a white horse. The armies which were in heaven, I believe that's us. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Tuck that in the back of your mind. We're going to talk about that more later. Um, not here, but a different place. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. He treadeth. Uh, the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So here we have he smites the nations with his sharp sword. Is that a real sword? Is it a figurative sword? Uh, look at verse number 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. If we are indeed the armies clothed in white that come back with Christ, we will fight with Christ against the beast, the Antichrist, in this battle. This is the Battle of Armageddon. It doesn't say the Valley of Megiddo here, uh, but this is the, the uh, Battle of Armageddon. And so we will fight with Christ against the beast and his army. Verse 20, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. And we, we touched on this once before, that Satan has a tri, uh, has, a, has a trinity, little t. Um, Satan, false prophet, and the beast, or the Antichrist. He, he has three. Uh, as God, God the Father, God the Son, uh, God the Holy Spirit, the beast was taken with him, the false prophets. So two of the three. Uh, and notice the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. And then this is interesting. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Uh, verse, 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about a lie and deception. And so we see deceiving here. Uh, the, the false prophet brought miracles and deceived them that received the mark of 
the beast. And these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the word of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. So just like Second Thessalonians 2 that said, you know, Christ basically, uh, God spoke. Mm -hmm. um, we have the speaking here. The sword which proceedeth out of his mouth is symbolic for God's word speaks and it, uh, it, it judges, it does uh, what he decrees will happen. So again, the, the, so the, the demise of the Antichrist is here at the end of the tribulation when Christ literally comes to earth with us as his armies. And the Antichrist is destroyed or thrown into the lake of fire uh, at that time. So uh, back to... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Should have had you maybe mark that. <clears throat> so 2 Thessalonians 2, again, verse 8. What verse? Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, so the restrainer is taken out of the way. The wicked is revealed, but the wicked is not consumed right away. There's at least three and a half years there, I, 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 and and again, with when we, when we get into the tribulation, we'll get into more details. Uh, we'll compare scriptures, scripture, uh, some things, and I'll, I'll try to be careful about some things we, we, don't know for sure. We have to just kind of conjecture, but from what I remember and what I've studied so far, um, the you know we we know in in uh, First Thessalonians five. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, you yourselves know, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse uh, 2, you yourselves know the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh. So there is a time of peace during the tribulation. Uh, it just makes sense that would be when the Antichrist has this, uh, confirms the treaty with Israel and there's peace and safety and everything's calm. And, you know, I've said this, several times uh if this one thing we have learned from the pandemic is somewhat a smooth talker could come in with the vaccine with the cure-all with you know and have a world following i mean you know it, it, at times it's like how could that ever we can see how that would happen you know we'd see firsthand how that is very likely and reasonable and not far-fetched uh, at all. And so that's what the Antichrist is going to be a military power. Remember, 10 kingdoms uh, takes over three of them. You know, he's the 11th, he takes over three of them. Um, he's going to have power to change times and seasons and do different things. So, uh, you know, military might, I believe he's going to be charismatic, uh, you know, a, a lot of things. But, uh, and there's going to be peace and safety for a while. Uh, but it's obviously not going to last. Is, is he, uh, you know, I, I think he's revealed before the three and a half year point. I think the three and a half year point is when he goes in the temple and he desecrates it, the, the abomination of desolation. And when we study this in detail, we'll, I'll, I'll be a little clearer and a little more, um, I guess, dogmatic where I can be and say where, where I can't be. But uh, verse 9 we have, so, so the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, in verse 8, sorry, destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that, that's Revelation 19. We just looked at that. Uh, and then it says, even him, so it's talking about the Antichrist, it's talking about the beast who's destroyed um, by Christ in verse 8, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs, and lying wonders. And so, obvious here, Satan is the one that is empowering the Antichrist. Uh, the Antichrist, the beast, has his power. He is propped up uh, by Satan. Uh, we had just looked, you don't need to turn there, but in Revelation 13, we, we saw where his 
uh, head was wounded, deadly wound in his head. And I take that to mean he was killed. And he was brought back to life. But again, it was the power behind it uh, was Satan. The world wandered after the beast. They worshipped the dragon. They worshipped Satan who gave, who miraculously restored um, the beast. And then they worshipped the beast as well. So Satan's power will be such that, that the world will be amazed because of how the beast was healed. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. And, and we question. won't... Go ahead. So, Satan actually shows himself or become, because there's Satan, Satan is the dragon, and then there's the beast. There's so false Satan actually of... walks on the earth in this three and a half year period. Um, I, I wouldn't go that far. They worship, I mean, Revelation 13, we just read, they worship the, the dragon. Um, was there worship of Satan ultimately because they're worshiping the beasts? Uh, was Satan in physical form? I guess I wouldn't say Satan was in physical form. Uh, so the well, beast would probably the beast, pro proclaim that he's right. being so, so powered think of it, by think of, think of it as people worshipped God by bowing down to Christ when Christ was on earth. Okay, you know, I, I guess I would, I would, I, at this point, I would lean more towards that way as opposed to Satan being in a physical form different than the false prophet, different than the, than the, the Antichrist or the beast. So I, I think both the beast and the false prophet were visible, and I, I believe Satan will not be. He'll just be behind, uh, behind it. A good question, though. Um, Verse number 10. <clears throat> so the working of Satan with powers and signs and of course lying wonders. I mean, bringing someone back to life again and, you know, some other things that Satan does. Um, verse number 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. So uh, the Antichrist is working with powers and signs and lying wonders and deceit uh, in them that perish. Notice, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, because they did not believe the truth, because they did not have the love of the truth, this was the cause mm -hmm. for them having the strong delusion. So the decision that they had to, verse 10, receive not the love of the truth, uh, verse 12, who believes not the truth, end of verse 12, had pleasure in unrighteousness, the, the lie and the delusion from God, and, and we'll touch on this again, because I think it's important. Uh, you know, there's like, wow, God makes people believe a lie. That sounds horrible. Okay, and at face value, it does. But when you consider what's happening here is they loved not the truth. They rejected the truth. Uh, they had pleasure in unrighteousness, and basically God let them have their way. God let them, and, and Romans 1 talks about that. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They had a mind that was against God, and uh, Romans 1, you know, boy, it talks about the United States right now, Romans 1, but um, the point I'm making here is God let them have their way. They did not want the truth. They rejected the truth. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so God let them go that way. Uh, their, their punishment for their choice to reject the truth was God 
allowing them, allowing Satan to uh, deceive them. So, but what I what I want us to do now, and, and again, we'll go through tribulation more uh, in the detail uh, in detail. But it's it's important for us to think about the fact that during the tribulation, there were a lot of people that heard the truth and that responded to the truth, and that's what I, I want us to. So I I really want to reinforce. Um, I, I do not, I've mentioned this a couple times, I think, uh, there, there are men that will preach, if you are not saved right now, and let's, let's use a Sunday morning, okay? I'm not naive enough to think that everyone who's here on a Sunday morning is born again and on their way to heaven. I, okay, I don't, I don't believe that. Um, I, that's why I give them, you know, we, we keep, I keep reminding people about that. It's not what you do, it's what Christ did. But imagine a Sunday morning, the rapture comes, and there's people still here, okay? There are some that will preach, there's men that will preach that, you know what, those people have heard before, and they will automatically believe the lie, and they will not be saved, okay? I don't think you can take this scripture this second thessalonians 2 and say that I, I don't believe you can say that okay uh at that moment they did not receive the truth but when i i just think when there's people that start having heard about it and start seeing some things really happening that and, and the reason i say that is because many people are saved during the tribulation uh, and, and the scripture is such that you can't argue, well, it's people who never heard before. It's people, it doesn't say that, okay? So Revelation chapter 7. So here's the here's big picture because we're, we're not going to finish it tonight. Big picture is these people in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, they rejected the truth. That is why they believed the lie. Okay, there are many that do not, during the tribulation, reject the truth. And that's what we're, we're going to uh, look at. So they made a conscious decision. So Revelation chapter 7. Yes? So in order for them to reject the truth, they, they had to come to a point where they were faced with conviction and, and said, no, they know God is who he says he is. You know, are there, and then you, you get into, there, there are people that believe in, you know, hyper-Calvinism, believe in irresistible grace, that God convicts you and you cannot say no. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm just right. saying, so we're, you know we're, how a person is, you know, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they surrender. I'm just saying, they, they get, get to, to that. a point where they are under that conviction and turn, say no. And so God, God ultimately knows that nothing would turn them. God, God certainly know. Would, would they, I guess what you're saying is if they were, what you're suggesting is if they were convicted where they knew for sure. Yeah, we wouldn't know that. I'm just saying from that and, and God, I mean, it would, and then once they get the mark, right? I think they have they, I think the mark is what seals the deal, so to speak. But um, yeah, I. I, I Sorry, we did this at home too. She's, she's too. She's too deep for me. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> you're so. What, if if I'm hearing you right, you're you're suggesting that they could, if, you know, I. Uh, the other part of your question is: Has someone ever been convicted? You know, we, we know the stories, right? There's people that hung on to the pew. They weren't about to go forward. And some go home and trust Christ, and some trust Christ a week later, and some a year later, and some... I guess I would be... As long as they're breathing, they have the opportunity to repent. Or they get um, the mark. But if they take the mark, their time... Yeah, they bought... They, rejected the truth to the point where now they have been deceived and 
uh, or now they have they've sealed their fate and, and taken the mark of the beast. And we're getting way ahead of ourselves on the mark of the beast. But anyway, um, okay, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. So, uh, verse number 2. Well, we, I guess we're going to read verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel. So there's four angels. Here's a fifth angel. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So four angels had a mission to go hurt the earth and the sea. But this fifth angel said, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. Don't hurt them. We have something we need to do first. We have to seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, I, I do not know. All right, again, maybe we, we will get into Revelation uh, in detail, and it will probably take us 10 years of Wednesday evening <laughs> to get through Revelation. But uh, um, the, the, the point of the seal, the point of the seal was to protect these 144,000, is what we're going to find out, to protect these servants of God from the harm that was going to come to the earth and to the sea, and to the trees. There was, the angels were going to leash out something, but the 144,000 were going to be protected. They had to have these seals. Uh, verse 10, I heard the number of them which is sealed. They were sealed. I'm sorry. Verse 4. Did I say verse 10? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a 4. We're going to um, get to it really fast. Yeah. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. I'm just I'm just going to park here for a minute. If you 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 basically there there is obvious symbolism in Revelation. Okay, there there is symbolism in Re Revelation. There are things that you need to take. Remember my little motto, which I stole from somebody? If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, okay? If there, there are people that do all kinds of crazy things with the 144. If this is not Jews, which it plainly says, from 12 tribes, and it lists the tribes, if it does not mean 144,000 Jews from 12 different tribes, then it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you can make it mean whatever you want. It's, you know, I was going to try and think of some absurd thing like ice cream flavors or something. But I mean, really, you know, you, it, it has to mean that. There is no reason to take it to mean. Now, there's all kinds of different questions like, well, how come Dan is left out? Dan is one of the original 12 tribes. And, and there's some rearranging of the list and whatnot. But... There is, in my simple mind, taking a literal, a natural interpretation of Scripture, there is no reason to doubt that these are 144, I mean, what do the Jehovah's Witnesses say? They're, they're, that's them. That's, that's them. Okay. Well, you've got to do some gymnastics with the Scripture to say it's you, a non-Jew, uh, that not in any of these tribes. Um, so, 12 tribes, 144,000 Jews, uh, they are servants of God. Some, some translations will call them slaves or bond servants. I mean, they are, they are servants of God. What do they do? We're not going to read verse 5. This is about some tribes, verse 6, 7, 8, not 8 gives all these tribes, 12,000 from 12 different tribes. We are not told how they serve God. We're not told what their role is. Okay, We're not given any description on what they do. But it is very interesting that right after 
this, who the 144,000 are, we have verse number nine. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms, uh, I believe that's palm leaves, in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So here's this great multitude, and it doesn't say that hadn't heard before, you know, it says all of all nations, okay, and kindreds and people and tongues. So there, there are some that, well, only people that never heard are going to be saved in the tribulation. That's not what it says. And this is a multitude that cannot be numbered, and they are before the throne saying that, or it was given, they were clothed in white robes, salvation to our God, and drop down, for the sake of time, we need to move a little bit, verse 13, um, one of the elders, remember the elders, four and 20 elders gather around the throne, I think the elders represent the, the church, they're the raptured church in heaven, one of the elders answered, verse 13, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed, arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? I love John's answer. John punts. This is not the only time he does this. He's like, he does it. Instead of saying, I don't know, like we would, he would say, you know, <laughs> you know, thou knowest. And that's what he says, Sir, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so here are people, a multitude, that are saved during the tribulation. Um, again, I'm just using the, the implication here. It doesn't say the 144,000 are evangelists spreading the good news. But they are servants of God, and right after they're mentioned, there's a bunch of, that it mentions a bunch of people that were saved. So I, I believe part of the witness, and, and there is, uh, I don't know if it's, there's, there is another one or two other places where it refers to the 144,000, but I believe they were witnesses during the tribulation. And, uh, you know, to have, verse 14, have their robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, that's talking about salvation. That's talking about salvation. You, you cannot uh, ignore that picture. And that's a, you know, that's a wonderful thing. Wash their robes. Um, you're familiar with the, the Old Testament uh, let's let's turn there to Isaiah chapter. We got. I'm going to finish in five minutes. Isaiah chapter sixty four. <clears throat> and, and some of us are familiar with this. We maybe don't know the reference, but we certainly have heard the verse before. Isaiah sixty four. Isaiah what? Isaiah sixty four verse six. So we're, we're talking about the robes being washed. Isaiah 64, verse 6, But we are all as unclean thing, as an unclean thing, and our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So we, we have that uh, reminder that our righteousnesses, our good efforts, our self-efforts, our works, uh, are the things that we think we put in a scale and tip the scale. There is no scale, but we think we tip the scale. All those things that we think are good and are going to earn favor with God are like filthy rags. 
They are worthless. They are no good. So just to have a robe become white, we can't make it white. God is the one who makes it white. There, they were given white robes. They washed, you know, where we just were, they washed their robe. They didn't wash their own robes. Their robes were washed by the payment of Christ's blood. Um, I'm not going to have you turn there, but uh, Zechariah chapter 3, uh, it says this, three uh, verses 3 and 4. Now Joshua, and Joshua was a priest uh, at that time when Zechariah was written, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. So we have that picture of a filthy garment being changed by God into a white garment. Uh, we're in Isaiah 61, I mean 64. Turn to 61, and we will be done. Isaiah 61, and that, that picture... Isaiah 61, verse number 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. I mean, you read this, you think, wow, this, this should be in the New Testament. If you, if you didn't know it was in Isaiah. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So we have that picture once again of being arrayed in white. Being, and, and it's not our doing. It's not us getting rid of the filthy robe. It's God, the great, the great exchange. God taking our sin on Christ, Christ's giving us his righteousness. And that happened to, or will happen, I should say, to a multitude in during the tribulation, according to what we just looked at in, uh, in Revelation chapter 7. So, um, and, and there, of course, the other little thought, maybe you, you caught this, uh, in Revelation 7, you don't need to turn there. They were in heaven. Okay? They were in heaven. They were saved during the tribulation. So they were martyred. I mean, they were killed during... They didn't all die of old age in a three and a half year span or a seven year span. Okay? They, they, were, they were killed. And so um, it is going to be... Uh, chaos is going to be decision time. Uh, there are those that will choose Christ. They will accept Christ. They will repent. They will see the signs. They will repent, accept Christ, uh, be given a robe of righteousness just like, like we are, uh, but their life will be short. And then there are those that will say no, and they will say no for good, and then they, they are the ones that will be believing uh, the lie. So any, um, any questions uh, about that? Not you, Louise. No. <laughs> I, I ask them as I, as I get along. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for the truth uh, that uh, there will be many uh, that are saved during the tribulation, and Lord, we, we recognize it's from all nations and uh, kindreds and people and tongues. And uh, yet, Lord, we know it's, it is presumptuous uh, to wait. If people are, are convicted now, uh, they understand now that their, their works, their self-efforts are like a robe that is filthy and that cannot stand before you. And the Lord, too many people.
try to clean up their own robe. They try to clean up their own life. They try to uh, work off their sin debt, so to speak. Uh, but they can't. Uh, they need to recognize that uh, they need to just come to you and uh, give you their dirty room. And you in turn will give them Christ's righteousness. And Lord, we just thank you for that uh, wonderful picture that we can really uh, relate to and understand. We uh, thank you for your mercy in uh, saving people during the tribulation. Uh, but again, Lord, I pray that there's uh, any are listening that uh, they would realize that uh, if you're working in their heart now, that now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, your grace and your patience. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the gift uh, that you gave us in Christ. And we pray in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thanks for listening in. <clears throat> I saw your hand, Art. <laughs>